Every second, every minute, every day, someone is impacted by mental illness. These are their faces. Mental health affects us all. Join the conversation. Good morning, everybody. Uh, a couple days ago, uh, you've probably seen the billboards and the advertising that uh, this awareness campaign for mental illness. And we decided as a church to join the conversation. And so during the month of February, we're actually going to do a series of four messages where we're bringing uh, up this important topic and looking to God's word for his uh, solutions. Uh, it's said that one in five Canadians suffer from mental illness and that everybody is affected by it in some way, shape, or form, either through a lower uh, maybe degree in your own life or maybe you know somebody who is suffering uh, severely. So we believe that there's hope, incredible hope, uh, for anything that comes at us as believers, as people who walk with Christ. And so uh, we're going to do four series, I'm going to, sermons rather, I'm going to do the first one today on disillusionment. And next week we're going to have a guest speaker, uh, Dr. Greg Mitchell, uh, who's the pastor of Every Nation Vancouver. And uh, he has uh, written some books on relational health, and he's going to talk about isolation and how relationships are very important uh, to uh, our well-being. And then uh, Pastor Richard is going to do one on anxiety, and we're going to follow up with uh, Sheila doing one on roots. How does our family background and, and how does the, the, the family and, and our past uh, affect us? So you might say, well, why exactly are we doing a series on uh, mental health? Well, the first reason is just because God is concerned with all of us. God didn't just make us a body. He didn't just make us a mind. God has made us a mind, a body, a soul, and even a spirit. And God is concerned with the totality uh, of our being. Secondly, uh, we're entering in this because the church and society at large has not done very well when it comes to the area of people struggling with any level of mental illness. Um, if we treated, have you ever seen these cartoons? If we treated uh, physical uh, health like we do uh, mental health, so here's someone you know lying in bed. Have you tried, you know, not having the flu? Or the next one? I think if you just changed your frame of mind, you'd feel better. Or how about this one? I get that you have food poisoning and all but you can at least make an effort for the rest of us. Here's someone bleeding out of their stomach. It's like you're not even trying. I don't think it's healthy to have to take medication every day just to feel normal. Do you worry that it's changing you from who you really are? And the last one, well, lying in bed all day clearly isn't helping. You need to get up and try something else. Sad, isn't it? It's, it's funny because it's sad, because we've often had those attitudes. Um, as some of you know, uh, I started my own counseling journey uh, almost three years ago. Uh, I used to think that people who went and saw a counselor were weak. Uh, I also used to think that anyone who is a pastor or a Christian leader who had to go see a therapist like, then they were just disqualified. There was something wrong with them. How dare they even be a leader? I see things completely different now, though. I view people who are willing to take the inward journey to understand themselves, their past, and even the deepest parts of their being as very courageous people. And so, in this series, we're not professional counselors. We're pastors. Dr. Greg Mitchell is the closest. He's taken a lot of uh, courses in counseling and things like that. But we are, we are qualified to do some things. And that is, we can help set the stage for all of us to be free from the stigma of mental health. And we can also look to the pages of scripture to show how God's word clearly acknowledges the painful aspects 
of our lives. So we're going to look at this thing called disillusionment. Um, when I quit my job as an optician and felt called to go to, from move to Vancouver to Calgary to plant a church, uh, I got very disillusioned. Here was the setting of why. The ministry that I was a part of was trying to do church planting on campus, and we decided that we felt the call to do this, and so quit my job. We didn't really know anybody in Calgary. We moved there October 1st, fall of 1989, with a two-year-old and a six-month-old, sold everything we had, pretty much, to believe to start this church at the University of Calgary. Within four weeks of us, that big move, the ministry that we were a part of folded. They, we got a call that it's ended. And all of a sudden, everything that we put our heart and soul into with this ministry for many years, even so much they're willing to quit our job and move to another city on behalf of this ministry, it was over. And here we are, jobless, two little kids, trying to figure out life. I was certainly disillusioned at that point. Our text today is taken from the 21st chapter of John where the followers of Jesus, his disciples, uh, right after the, the death of Jesus, they had a disillusioned time in their life where, whoa, everything that we gave three lives, three years of our lives to is over. What do we do? Sometimes, you know, when we read the pages of Scripture, all the tough parts, we already know the ending. They didn't. It's easy to read, you know, the story, the classic stories of the Bible. It's okay, Jonah, you're going to get out of that well. You know, it's, it's okay, no, the rain will stop eventually. Uh, you know, whatever it is. But for the disciples, put yourself in their shoes and just think of the emotional letdown and the absolute disillusionment of their lives. So, John 21, verses 1 to 8. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other of the disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said, We'll go with you. They went out and got into the boat. That night, they caught nothing. Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and he threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, but about a hundred yards off. Lord, bless the reading of your word, and God, as we extract your principles and what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to look at four things about disillusionment. First of all, we're just going to define it. What is it? Uh, who does it affect? What happens when we are disillusioned? And how should we respond uh, when we are? So first of all, what is disillusionment? It's more than a disappointment. So last night, hockey night in Canada, I'm slowly becoming a Leafs fan. They're a better team. They're getting better. And last night, they got whooped by the Boston Bruins. Now, I'm disappointed. Okay, I'm disappointed. I spent a couple hours watching that game, blowing my Saturday night when I should be polishing up my sermon. Uh, and they lose. Anyway, 4-1, I think, was the final score. I actually turned it, I, I quit watching at the end. Um, I hate empty, empty net goals. Um, so that's a disappointment. There's all kinds of things that can be disappointments in our life. But disillusionment goes much deeper. Here's a definition of it. A feeling of disappointment akin to depression arising from the realization that something is not what it is expected 
or believed to be, possibly accompanied by psychological or philosophical angst from having one's beliefs changed. And this is where the disciples were at, disillusioned. They were thinking, did we live a lie? Why did we, uh, why did we even do this? You know, that was what was happening to me in Calgary when that ministry ended and I had to figure out, do I go forward? How do I go forward? Uh, did, and and th those thoughts, did I live a lie? Like, was this, was this even worth it? And so there's many times where something that you really, really thought was going to happen. You know, everyone who gets married thinks, wow, they have this big, big wedding and everything. Comes, and you're, you're just thinking that we're going to have an incredible life together. And then, and then many times it crashes, sometimes it crashes and burns. And all of a sudden, wow, you know, all that I was hoping for and dreaming for in that moment, it never happened. Maybe, you know, you come through your university years and you persevere and you get that job that you wanted or you thought you wanted and all of a sudden you come to the end of it and you go, it's nothing like you thought it was going to be and you put all that time and effort. You were so counting on this to be the thing that would make you happy and boom, it, it's, it, it's making you miserable. So it's something more than just a disappointment. And who does disillusionment affect? Well, everybody actually. And this sermon will be good whether you're feeling a bit disillusioned right now or not. Because you can use things that I'm going to share with you today to think about things like what happened back then? You can actually process, in other words, a past event. Maybe you're feeling disillusioned even now. And if neither of those two were your case, I guarantee you, you'll need it for some time in the future. When we talk about the four chapter story of God, I always try to work this picture into every sermon I preach almost. Uh, because I just think it's so important for us to come back to understanding of not just what the Bible says, but the worldview that we believe in as believers. That God created everything good and perfect. We are of good origin. That sin came into the world, there was a fall and messed everything up. Jesus has come to set up his kingdom and begin to restore all things. And he paid the price through dying on the cross so that we can have our sins forgiven. And that we can be a part of the advance of this new kingdom that he offers us to live in. And then one day it will all be made right. So we kind of, a lot of you can rattle off from hearing that so much from myself or Richard, another speaker. But sometimes what we don't get is that that chapter two isn't just out there. It's not, well, Adam and Eve sinned and it caused, you know, the fall. But chapter two is a reality of each one of our lives. There are chapter two disappointments. There's chapter two parts of our life as we go through life that come to each and every person. And if we just have this false kind of sunny day Christianity where every day is just kind of this bright and everything's perfect, we're going to be very let down. Jesus said, in this life, in this world, you will have tribulation. The difference for someone who walks with God is take courage because I've overcome the world. It's, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. It's not, hey, if you follow Jesus, you get to skip the, 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 the dark valley. You just get to skip over. Oh, good. No, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Why? Because you're with me. That's it. It's not that there'll never be a dark time in our lives, but God will be with us. And so this disillusionment, uh, unfortunately, is part of life. Number three, what happens when we are disillusioned? Well, what happened uh, to the disciples? They were going to be Jesus' followers. They were going to go and change the world. They were, they'd already began to experience it. They began to do healing and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. They, they, got a, they had a good start on it, actually. And then it got turned into what? Let's keep going and do this great thing that he called us to? Now, what did Peter say? Ah, let's just go back fishing. Let's just go back fishing. And so the first thing that happens when we're disillusioned is vision is lost. I'm telling you, after a month in Calgary, my vision that we could have a church on that campus was gone. In fact, my sermons in that little church that we started on our home were so pitiful when I was disillusioned. 
this would be a sermon. I'm honestly, Sunday morning in our house, gathering in as many students and people that would, you know, we could get into that, jam into that house by the university. And I'd begin a sermon something like, well, I guess I'm supposed to preach to you today, but I'm not even sure if our church has a right to exist. I'm not even sure about whether this is legitimate. Why are you guys here anyhow? Oh, well, I guess I did move here. Let's find something in the Bible to preach on. I mean, I've literally said those words on a Sunday morning, like in the first couple months of a church. It is a miracle that that church got off the ground and is thriving to this day, meeting in one of the biggest theaters at the University of Calgary. Because I was this, but what happened? What I'm saying is that in a disillusioned state, vision is lost. Uh, second, is that dissidence sets in. Dissidence is when what we believe and what we experience are at odds. What we believe and what we're experiencing are at odds. What you, or another way to say it, is what you believe about God and what you're experiencing doesn't line up. What you believe about God and what you're experiencing right in the moment doesn't line up. I mean, there's times where I've thought, I know the kingdom of God is true and good and right, but I'm not super happy about it, and I'm not super happy about spreading that message right now. What, what's going on in my life at that moment is that I know it's true, but I'm not feeling it in the moment because something's going on in my life where I'm where there's there's something at odds something that I'm having a hard time processing a difficult time when we moved to Toronto five years ago after living I'm a Canadian but we lived 14 years uh, in the United States and after 14 years we felt the call back to Canada and we thought the hard part of that would be separating our family, where our two oldest children stayed in the States, the two younger ones came with us. Uh, again, leaving a well-paying job to go back to raising support and figuring, you know, living by faith. Um, you know, selling everything, trying to figure out a move, trying to come back. I mean, I felt like an immigrant to my own country. It was so hard to get a driver's license and everything else. I remember going up to that counter at Service Canada and, and not being able to get like a regular license. And they said, well, sir, we can give you a learner's permit because it doesn't look like you can prove to me that you've ever driven before. I said, look at all these documents. Well, they're not in the right order. So you want to give me a, a learner's license? And then I checked what the insurance was going to be for me, being a man 50 years old and needing that. My insurance on the car was going to be like $6,000. And I'm going like, nothing is working here, Lord. Um, I thought, though, that the hard part would be the transition coming here, and, and when we got here, the fun was just beginning. And so, what I was believing wasn't lining up with what I was hoping and expecting. I thought the hard part was leaving Nashville, and we got here, it would be easy. And then we got here, and it was harder than the first part. And so, what I was experiencing didn't line up with this vision that I had in my heart and what my hope and my dream was when I landed uh, here in Toronto. Don't worry, things are a lot better now. <laughs> um, so look at the even the definition of disillusion. When you look at what's an illusion? An illusion is something that deceives by producing a false or misleading impression of reality. Isn't that what an illusion is? An illusionist is tricking you. Sleight of hand, it's not really real, but it looks real. And so what is disillusion is a freeing of being, a freeing of being freed from illusion uh, or conviction. So what happens is that when we're disillusioned, we're actually breaking free from the illusion that we were living in. There was a false reality that we were actually hoping and believing for and when we're disillusioned, the positive part of it is it breaks apart. We see that it's not going to be easy in Toronto. Okay, great. So Lord, but so what does that mean? It means you're going to have to develop your faith. It means that I'm still with you. It means that you're supposed to keep going. It's just the idea of how you thought that was going to happen has now changed. It was an illusion. And now you've been disillusioned. You've broken away from the illusion that I didn't want you to live in. 
Here's the thing about, about the disciples. Jesus told them this was going to happen. Jesus told them this was going to happen. Why couldn't they hear it? Matthew 16, 21, this is what Jesus said. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day, rise again. Why couldn't the disciples, when Jesus Christ told them plainly what was going to happen, why couldn't they believe it? I'll tell you why. It's because they didn't like that part about the dying and the killing and all of that. They weren't able to they weren't able to hear it. You see, in all of our lives, there's something psychological that kicks in. That when something gets when certain truths become so hard to believe, this filter kicks into our minds and we won't accept it. You know, the Apostle Paul had the same thing when he was on his way to Rome. And he knew that it wouldn't be a sunny day Christianity. Here's what Paul said in Acts 20, 22 to 23, because Paul learned how to break free from illusions. He said, and now behold, I'm going to Jerusalem, constrained by the Spirit, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies to me that in every city that imprisonment and afflictions await me. It was actually the disciples around him that were prophesying that these things were happening, were going to happen, and told Paul, don't go, don't go, don't go. And Paul was saying, are you kidding? I don't want to live in an illusion. God's called me to it. Yeah, it's going to be hard, but he's going to be with me. But in all of our lives, we have difficulty believing hard and painful things. And so what we do is we, we, we begin to believe in an illusion. Sometimes, I've been reading this book by Dr. Henry Cloud on called Necessary Endings. And the theme of the book is that you can't hope, you can't have true hope when there's a hope where there's going to be a hopeless outcome. The only way to have true hope is to end the false hope so that you can come into a new hope. If you're going the wrong way, if you're driving and you want to go to Vancouver and you start getting on the 401 and you start going towards Montreal, the opposite direction, it's a hopeless case. You are not going to arrive in Vancouver. The only way that you can have hope, no matter how much you believe, is say, I'm going the wrong way. And end that course of action, turn around and go the other way. Then you have hope. Because you've changed the direction. What happens when we're disillusioned? Here's, you're, I can feel it in this room, you're ready for some good news, okay? I know this is, this is heavy, but you can handle it. We believe in speaking the truth here. We need to speak the truth. We need to be in, in that place. But here's the third thing. Relationships continue. It's interesting in the story that there were seven of the disciples. And they weren't all a part of you know, Peter's fishing business or anything like that. But what was interesting about it is when Peter said, okay, well, let's just go back fishing. They all said, okay, let's all do it together. What happened is that during those three years, relationships were formed. Relationships were formed. Relationships were formed that were bigger than the vision. Jesus actually left them together for a bit. So it's not just about the vision. It's about the people that I wanted to knit together. A couple of days ago, uh, I spoke to my mentor, uh, Rice Brooks, one of the co-founders of this uh, ministry. And it's interesting because um, when I was disillusioned at that season when I, we were starting the Calgary Church, the ministry that we were a part of was no more. But I thought, what am I going to do? And it was actually at that time that I read this passage. And I saw in the scripture how Peter and the disciples, when Jesus was one away, still stuck together, even though they weren't sure about the vision. And I thought, okay, what are my relationships? Now, I remember Rice Brooks. He was the guy who led me to the Christ in my dorm room at UBC while I was a second-year student. And I thought, well, there's a relationship. And I tracked him down and called him up, and I said, hey, you know, it'd be great if, you know, we hung out, you know, and uh, how about coming to Calgary? He goes, well, what do you got going to, in Calgary? He said, well, I'm starting this church. <laughs> and he said, yeah, sure, you know, I'll come up. 
And then I remember in the summertime, another guy named Steve Burrell, who's another co-founder of our movement, he was visiting a church in Edmonton. And I, thought, and I found out about it, and I thought, oh man, Steve Merle, there's another relationship. I said, Steve, hey, why don't you come and hang out with me and be a part of this little church that I've got going in Calgary. And he goes, yeah, sure. And I can remember the Merle staying with us and several times. And, and then another relationship and another relationship. Pretty soon, a few years later, this new ministry emerged out of that relationship and many others called Every Nation. When the vision was gone, the relationship stood. And that's an awesome thing. And finally, how should we respond when we are disillusioned? God's still there. Consider the way that God is still there. In the New American Standard Version, it doesn't say, do you have any fish? It actually says this. Children, Jesus calling out, you don't have any fish, do you? You don't have any fish, do you? What does that tell us? Jesus knew exactly where they were in their disillusioned state. He knew it. It was necessary for them to have this dark time to come out the other end. And he knew it. He was almost playing with them a little bit. You ever feel like God's playing with you a little bit? It's sort of like when my kids were little and we'd like fight and wrestle. It's like I couldn't bring, like when they're three and four, like you can't really wrestle like full blown, right? You'll kill them. Uh, you're sort of, you're sort of like, you know, they let, you let, you let your kids jump back on you and pin you and they think that they, you know, won the wrestling match or whatever, you know. It's like, but any time I can just put them down. <laughs> so God, sometimes it feels like God is like that in our lives where He's still there. He, he's, he's not giving up. He's, he's letting us experience a little bit of hardship. But He's still there. And then when John in, in verse 7 said, it's the Lord. He's back. It's the Lord. I love that verse. It's the Lord. We have a choice. At the end of a disillusion period in our life, when the Lord reappears, we have a choice to make. We can either give up, we can either say, uh-uh, or we can be like Peter. Jump back into the water. I'm going for it again. It's Jesus. Let's go. And then they all, I mean, he was so zealous. I mean, he didn't wait for the boat to come in. He said he just jumped in and they came afterwards. So, what am I saying to you? When those seasons come and you feel you persevere, I feel like in my life I'm coming out of, out of a season of maybe some difficulties. But I feel like the Lord's really manifesting self. It, it's, it, it's becoming a good season for me in my life right now. I can sense it. And now is not the time for me to think, yeah, but it was hard, you're going to be disappointed. It's time for me to leave those thoughts behind. It's time for me to enter into what God has for me today. It's time to jump back in with all of our hearts, exercising all of our faith to follow the Lord again for what He has in the next chapter in each and every one of our lives. We're going to conclude just set with communion. And as we take communion, let's trust the Lord. Let's trust the Lord that no matter if there's a season maybe in the future that's Maybe going to be a struggle time for you that you'll you'll be ready for it. Or maybe you you need to make sense of some things that have already happened in the past. You know, reflect as we take communion today. Or maybe right now you're saying, "Oh man, it's tough. I feel like some things in my life have come disillusion for me." Then take the elements, believing that He's right there with you. I'm going to turn it over to Rich right now as he as he leads us.